Fulcanelli, often referred to as the last alchemist, is said to have created the Philosopher's Stone or the Elixir of Life, thus achieving immortality. Fulcanelli was the name used by a French alchemist and esoteric author whose identity is still debated. The name Fulcanelli seems to be a play on words. Vulcan, the ancient Roman god of fire, plus El, a Canaanite name for God and so the sacred fire. The appeal of Fulcanelli as a cultural phenomenon is due partly to the mystery of most aspects of his life and his disappearance. In particular, he is reputed to have twice performed a transmutation of lead into gold. The first was in 1922, together with his most devoted pupil Eugène Cancelier, when the two supposedly performed a successful transmutation of 100 grams of lead into gold in the presence of Julien Champagne and Gaston Sauvage. This demonstration took place in a laboratory of the gas works of the Georgie Company at Sarcelles, and was achieved with the use of a small quantity of projection powder, also known as the Philosopher's Stone, prepared by Fulcanelli. The second was in 1937 at the Chateau de Leray, when Fulcanelli supposedly performed a transmutation of 225 grams of lead into gold and 100 grams of silver into uranium before witnesses including a chemist, two physicists, and a geologist. After this, Fulcanelli disappeared completely. Fulcanelli bestowed the 20th century, marked by increasing scientific discoveries, with many references to the secret ancient knowledge for mastering the forces of the material world in his two hermetic books, The Mystery of the Cathedrals and the Dwellings of the Philosophers, published by his students after his mysterious disappearance in 1926. The work that bears his name attracted a whole new group of seekers who suddenly believed in the power of their own magic and understood that ancient knowledge is actually preserved by the unknown individuals who have managed to master their lives despite all material laws. Fulcanelli was likely a Frenchman educated in the ways of alchemical law, architecture, art, science, and languages. Theories about Fulcanelli speculate that he was one or another famous French occultist of the time, perhaps a member of the former royal family, the House of Valois, or another member of the Brothers of Heliopolis, a society centered around Fulcanelli. Many theories have been made in an attempt to solve this mystery. He has been associated with the mythical and timeless Count Saint Germain too, but his identity will remain unknown. No one really knows who Fulcanelli was, the pseudonym behind a great work, and an even greater legend. Many dedicated seekers have tried to identify his traces, but apart from discovering their own paths, they have had no luck. Even when explaining the alchemical process of transforming metal into gold and overcoming death, Fulcanelli confused the interlocutor by leading him back from the alchemical process to his identity. The vital thing is not the transmutation of the metals, but that of the experimenter himself. It is an ancient secret that is rediscovered by a few people every century. Unfortunately, only a handful of them succeed. Fulcanelli is trying to explain the great work here, emphasizing that the purpose of alchemy in completing the great work is not to focus solely on creating gold, but rather to transform oneself into a higher, purified state of being. Accomplishing the great work represents the culmination of the spiritual path, the attainment of enlightenment, or the rescue of the human soul from the unconscious forces which bind it. The great work signifies the spiritual path towards self-transcendence in its entirety. This is the process of bringing unconscious complexes into the conscious awareness in order to integrate them back into oneself. This transformation is symbolized by the alchemical process of transmuting lead into gold. In this analogy, you represent the lead, the base spirit, and the goal is to transmute yourself into gold, the divine spirit, which represents the reuniting of the soul with the divine. Alchemists believed that the process enabled them to generate gold within themselves. They equated gold with the sun and sought to manifest its radiance within their own beings, effectively creating an internal sun. Gold is the metal of the sun and has been considered by many as crystallized sunlight. When gold is mentioned in alchemical tracts, it may be either the metal itself or the celestial orb, which is the source or spirit of gold. As gold was the symbol of spirit and the base metals represented man's lower nature, Certain alchemists were called miners and were pictured with picks and shovels digging into the earth in search of the precious metal. Some people used a pearl hidden in the shell of an oyster at the bottom of the sea to signify spiritual powers. Thus, the seeker after truth became a pearl fisher. He descended into the sea of material illusion in search of understanding. When the alchemists stated that every animate and inanimate thing in the universe contained the seeds of gold, they meant that even the grains of sand possessed a spiritual nature for gold was the spirit of all things. 
The purpose of alchemy was not to make something out of nothing, but rather to fertilize and nurture the seed which was already present. Its processes did not actually create gold, but rather made the ever-present seed of gold grow and flourish. Slightly before the First World War, Fulcanelli supposedly met another famous French alchemist of the time named Schwala de Lubitsch. Fulcanelli approached Schwala one day at a cafe, telling him that he had heard about him and inviting him to stop by his house to discuss certain topics that were best not spoken about in public. Upon their meeting, Fulcanelli informed Schwala about a manuscript he had stolen from a Paris bookshop. While cataloguing an ancient book for a bookseller, Fulcanelli stumbled upon a peculiar piece of writing, a six-page manuscript in fading ink, hidden inside Sir Isaac Newton's alchemical studies. According to Fulcanelli, this manuscript described the significance of color in the alchemical process. Fulcanelli and Schwaller met often and discussed the great work, the transmutation of spirit and matter. Tired of the distractions of Paris, Schwaller moved to Grasse in the south of France, where he invited Fulcanelli to join him in an alchemical retreat. There, after much work, they performed a successful opus involving the secrets of alchemical stained glass the peculiarly evocative reds and blues of the rose windows of cathedrals like the unearthly Chartres had eluded artisans since the Middle Ages. In Grasse, Schwaller and Fulcanelli may have cracked the formula. By prearrangement, this was intended to be their last meeting, and all traces of their association were to be eliminated, never to be mentioned again. The monthly stipend would cease, and Fulcanelli was to leave directly. There was to be no discussion, no further conversation after the experiment, and regardless of success or failure, no subsequent meeting was envisioned. The driver was waiting, the luggage loaded. Schwaller noticed the new spark in Fulcanelli's eyes, the new power and his bearing. They parted as strangers to each other in all ways, including their interpretation of what they had made come to pass. There was tension between the two, and the suspicion exists that Fulcanelli stole more than a manuscript from a bookseller. The ideas for his most famous work, The Mystery of the Cathedrals, are said to have been taken from Schwaller de Lubitsch. It is said that at this time, Schwaller had already been diligently working on documenting the hermetic symbolism found in European cathedrals. Fulcanelli became aware of Schwaller's extensive work in deciphering cathedral symbolism, which Schwaller intended to compile into a book for potential publication. Fulcanelli, always boasting about his connections in the publishing world, expressed interest in borrowing Schwaller's first draft to assess its suitability for publishing. Schwaller, trusting Fulcanelli, readily agreed and thought nothing more of it when the draft took longer than expected to be returned. However, when Schwaller finally received the draft back, Fulcanelli insisted that the information should not be published, as it revealed too much and could lead to adverse consequences. Schwaller agreed, having had the same thought about sharing his powerful discoveries. Schwaller gave no further thought to this interaction until years later, when to his astonishment a book called The Mystery of the Cathedrals had been published. However, this story remains nothing more than a myth. Fulcanelli's primary work manifests as The Mystery of the Cathedrals, written in the year 1922 and unveiled to the public in Paris during the year 1926. Fulcanelli suggests a fascinating similarity, pointing out that just as the Egyptian pyramids hold a series of mysteries, the architecture and engineering of medieval Gothic cathedrals also conceal occult knowledge. He held the belief that these structures served a purpose beyond their dedication to Christianity's magnificence. They were also repositories of divine secrets, housing the profound musings of our forefathers pertaining to philosophy, religion, and society. Cathedrals, like sanctuaries in general, possess an inherent welcoming essence, offering refuge to those burdened with disgrace. Moreover, these sacred spaces serve as realms for spiritual enlightenment and the initiation of spiritual seekers. According to Fulcanelli, the term Gothic comes from art goth a particular form of language that allows others to convey or interpret certain thoughts. That would become the language of the Freemasons, who built the cathedrals and transferred this secret, understood by a few, using the same language that Christ used, parables. In this regard, cathedrals become a spoken Kabbalah. According to Fulcanelli, the phonetic Kabbalah is a special use of language, drawing on phonetic similarities and other symbolic techniques to expand the expressive reach of words. It is important to mention that this phonetic Kabbalah is not the Hebrew Kabbalah. Even the derivation is different. The phonetic Kabbalah is derived from the Latin Kabbalus, a horse, as in the Horse of Troy in the Iliad. It is basically homophonic and symphonic, rather than numerical. 
It is based on phonetic assonance and resonance to echo the gay science in the words of the ancient Greek deities spoken in sacred ancient Greek nomenclature. According to Walter Lang, who wrote an introduction to the English translation of Fulcanelli's The Mystery of the Cathedrals, the basic principles of the phonetic Kabbalah are restored in Fulcanelli's work. Fulcanelli states that even the smallest details in the cathedrals hide an occult meaning. It is the Kabbalistic art to conceal an arcane meaning in every representation in order to create a link with the Creator. For instance, everything inside cathedrals was adorned with gold and painted in vibrant colors, symbolizing the gates of paradise. The temple prominently featured three main colors, white, signifying purity and the sought-after light for the initiated, black, representing all that is evil or associated with darkness, and red, symbolizing the culmination of the spiritual journey where the spirit prevails over the physical body. Together, these three colors are referred to as oriflamma, also known as the triple colors of the work. Once again, they represent the path from darkness to illumination and ultimately to the spiritual realm. His secondary work, The Dwellings of a Philosopher, published in 1929, shares a similarity in essence to his primary work. In this compelling masterpiece, Fulcanelli delves into the realm of medieval castles and dwellings, analyzing their architectural forms, architectural proportions, painted windows, and carvings. Fulcanelli not only presents his findings, but also adeptly proves the validity of his facts. Throughout his work, he blends together historical narratives, architectural analysis, and esoteric knowledge, creating a masterpiece that is both intellectually stimulating and artistically captivating. These two books are perhaps the most important alchemical works of the past two centuries. Fulcanelli's sentinel masterpiece takes the attentive reader through the alchemical labyrinth, decoding the monuments and architectural decoration built by those who have actively engaged in the great work. Fulcanelli instructs us by showing that history must be interpreted by the monuments that have been left, and not by the historians who construct a worldview exclusively through documents, which method gives us an often jaded and unrepresentative view of what transpired. Not only does Fulcanelli decode and interpret the various alchemical symbols of the houses of the alchemist and philosophers, but he also goes to great lengths to lay bare and explicate the alchemical worldview of past centuries. Fulcanelli presents us with the deep mysteries of the great work. Jacques Bergier, who is an important character later on, was a chemical engineer, a member of the French Resistance, and a writer. He, together with Louis Pauls, wrote the famous book, The Morning of the Magicians, in which they link alchemy to atomic physics and suggest that the early alchemists knew more about the actual function of atoms than was officially assumed and known. The book also explores topics like crypto-history, ufology, occultism in Nazism, spiritual philosophy, and Die Glocke, a top-secret scientific technological device or secret weapon developed in the 1940s in Nazi Germany. In the book, there is a discussion of a significant encounter that occurred in 1953, nine years after the supposed disappearance of Fulcanelli, where one of the authors, Louis Powells, first met an alchemist. It was at the Café Procope in Paris, which was then coming into fashion again. A famous poet, during the time I was writing my book on Gurdjieff, had arranged the meeting, and I was often to see this singular man again, though I never succeeded in penetrating his secrets. After engaging in a very friendly conversation, Louis Powells asked the mysterious man about Fulcanelli. In response, the man stated that despite Fulcanelli's disappearance, he is not dead. He said, It is possible to live infinitely longer than an unawakened man could believe. And one's appearance can change completely, I know this. My eyes know it. I also know that there is such a thing as the Philosopher's Stone. Alchemy, in our view, could be one of the most important relics of a science, a technology, and a philosophy belonging to a civilization that has disappeared. What we have discovered in alchemy in the light of contemporary knowledge does not lead us to believe that techniques so subtle, so complicated, and so precise can have been the result of a divine revelation fallen from heaven. Not that we reject altogether the notion of a revelation, but in what we have read about the saints and the great mystics, we have never noticed that God spoke to men in technical language. Place thy crucible, O my son, tinder polarized light, rinse out the slag in water thrice distilled. Alchemy contains the fragments of a science that has been lost, fragments that, in the absence of their context, we find it difficult to understand or to make use of. Progress from this point must necessarily be halting, but in a definite direction. 
There is also a profusion of technical, moral, and religious interpretations. Finally, on those in whose hands these fragments are preserved, there is an imperious obligation to maintain secrecy. Fulcanelli believed that alchemy was the connecting link with civilizations that disappeared thousands of years ago and of which the archaeologists know nothing. Of course, no archaeologist or historian of high repute will admit that civilizations have existed in the past more advanced than ours in science and techniques. But advanced techniques and scientific knowledge simplify enormously the machinery, and traces of what they accomplished are perhaps staring us in the face without our being able to recognize them for what they are. No serious historian or archaeologist who has not had a very thorough scientific education could carry out the researches and explorations that would be likely to throw any light on these matters. The strict segregation of the various disciplines necessitated by the fabulous advances in modern science has perhaps concealed from us other fabulous discoveries of an earlier age. And the question arises, if there were such advanced ancient civilizations in the past, then where did they go? Why did they disappear? Well, with such advanced powers, great responsibility also comes. If you fail to keep this great power in check, a great destruction will inevitably follow. Eugène Cancelier, a disciple of Fulcanelli, and one of the leading specialists on alchemy, was greatly struck by a passage in a study which Jacques Berger had written as a preface to one of the classics in the Bibliothèque Mondiale, an anthology of 16th century poetry. In this preface, Berger alluded to the alchemists and their cult of secrecy. This is what he wrote, on this particular point, it is difficult not to agree with them. If there is a recipe for producing hydrogen bombs on a kitchen stove, it is clearly preferable that this recipe should not be disclosed. A meeting between Jacques Bergier and Fulcanelli reportedly occurred during June 1937 in a laboratory of the gas board in Paris. Fulcanelli communicated with Jacques Bergier to warn French nuclear physicist André Helbronner of man's impending use of nuclear weapons. According to Fulcanelli, nuclear weapons had been used before, by and against humanity. André Helbronner, a nuclear physicist, and Chevillon, a French occultist and Grand Master, among others, were assassinated by the Gestapo towards the end of World War II. Jacques Bergier claimed that eight years before the first atomic bomb test in New Mexico, he was approached by a formidable, mysterious stranger and asked to deliver a message to André Helbronner. The man said that he felt it was his duty to warn scientists of the danger of nuclear energy, since the alchemists of the past had obtained this secret knowledge, and it had destroyed them. Jacques Bergier believed that this mysterious figure was Fulcanelli. The following is a verbatim translation of the original transcript of the rendezvous. You're on the brink of success, as indeed are several others of our scientists today. Please allow me. Be very, very careful, I warn you. The liberation of nuclear power is easier than you think, and the radioactivity artificially produced can poison the atmosphere of our planet in a very short time, a few years. Moreover, atomic explosives can be produced from a few grains of metal powerful enough to destroy whole cities. I'm telling you this for a fact. The alchemists have known it for a very long time. I shall not attempt to prove to you what I'm now going to say, but I ask you to repeat it to Mr. Helbronner. Certain geometrical arrangements of highly purified materials are enough to release atomic forces without having recourse to either electricity or vacuum techniques. The secret of alchemy is this. There is a way of manipulating matter and energy so as to produce what modern scientists call a field of force. The field acts on the observer and puts him in a privileged position face to face with the universe. From this position he has access to the realities which are ordinarily hidden from us by time and space, matter and energy. This is what we call the great work. Fulcanelli also mentioned plutonium, a substance not isolated until February 1941 and officially named until March 1942. This inconsistency arose five years after Bergier's encounter, deepening the mystery. The astonishing story captured the attention of the American Office for Strategic Services, OSS, precursor to the CIA. They launched a thorough investigation to find Fulcanelli after the war, but failed to locate him. According to Eugène Cancelier, disciple of Fulcanelli, his last encounter with Fulcanelli happened in 1953, years after his disappearance, when he went to Spain and there was taken to a castle high in the mountains for a rendezvous with his former master. Cancelier had known Fulcanelli as an old man in his 80s, but now the master had grown younger and had physically changed in appearance. He had both male and female characteristics. He was androgynous, which is the final stage of alchemical transformation, 
a being Fulcanelli called the Divine Androgyne. Just like in the Hermetic creation myth, when God created the cosmos, God then created man androgynous in his own image. This suggests that Fulcanelli supposedly achieved a divine transformation, allowing him to revert back to his true form. The reunion was brief, and Fulcanelli once again disappeared, not leaving any trace of his whereabouts. Fulcanelli was mainly popularized by Eugène Cancellier. Many people believe he was a fraudster, while others believe he was the real Fulcanelli in disguise. However, the true answer may remain a mystery and we may never know for certain. But the legend of Fulcanelli is undoubtedly fantastic, and whether it is a true story or not, there are undoubtedly valuable truths and knowledge within these tales. Especially noteworthy are the alchemical teachings and the cautionary message regarding nuclear weapons, which are of utmost importance to discuss and acknowledge. For the alchemist, it must never be forgotten that power over matter and energy is only a secondary reality. The real aim of the alchemist's activities, which are perhaps the remains of a very old science belonging to a civilization long extinct, is the transformation of the alchemist himself, his accession to a higher state of consciousness. The material results are only a pledge of the final result, which is spiritual. Everything is oriented toward the transmutation of man himself, toward his deification, his fusion with the divine energy, the fixed center from which all material energies emanate. It is a science that tends to exalt man rather than matter. As Teilhard de Chardin puts it, the real aim of physics should be to integrate man as a totality in a coherent representation of the world.